Hi and thank you for watching this video in which I would like to do an update on current events happening in the world and exciting developments that I believe we should keep an eye on from a prophetic perspective. We have been searching for situations in which biblical prophecy lines up with events occurring in the world for many years now and some of the aspects that stood out for me over the past two years include the Revelation 12 sign that occurred on September 23rd of 2017 the nations that have been gathering in Syria, and specific events that were associated with Israel. Two of these include President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and this would seem to be a repetition of events that took place after Israel's exile to Babylon and King Cyrus's proclamation to rebuild Jerusalem. I believe it is important to consider the fact that this happened after Israel was in Babylon for 70 years. Secondly, the rededication of the Third Temple's altar that occurred in December of 2018 was also very significant, even though this did not receive a lot of media attention. From a biblical viewpoint, these were very significant events that have occurred in association with Israel's 70th anniversary of being a nation again and having returned to the land that God promised Abraham through his son Isaac. There are a number of other pointers that I believe we have been given in the Word of God to watch for during the weeks before us, given what was said and reported in the news over the past few weeks. And that is what I would like to focus on today. I hope you will be as excited as I am after making the connections between events currently occurring in the world and what we are told in the Word of God by the time you have finished watching. So what are some of the things currently happening to keep an eye on that would be important from a biblical point of view? We know that the Word of God describes to us a situation in which people will have to accept a mark in their bodies in order to buy and sell during the tribulation. And when we look at what is happening between the UK and the EU, this may very well be the start of bringing about the collapse of the world's economies and financial systems that will require the beast system to be implemented. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. When it comes to bringing about a condition in which the entire world's economy could be impacted so that a global reset could occur and a one world currency introduced, Brexit or the United Kingdom's departure out of the European Union would be one of the prime candidates for contributing to such a plan, in my opinion. The United Kingdom is one of the financial capitals of the world and should the UK crash out of the EU on March 29th without a deal, such a situation could have far-reaching consequences not only for the economy of the UK but also for the economies of many other countries. The European Union have stated that they are not open to renegotiate the deal that is currently on the table and going by what we see happening currently the UK will very likely crash out of the EU on March 29th without a deal. It is also quite striking that the globalists who own The Economist magazine have pictured Brexit coinciding with the apocalypse in this cartoon. If the plan of those who operate behind the scenes is to crash the entire world's economy, and I am now only speculating, then one would also expect something to happen in the USA that would affect Wall Street in such a way that it would coincide with the timing of Brexit in order to obtain maximum impact. The feud between the Democrats and President Trump would also seem to form part of a plan given the threats to shut the government down again on February 15th. If no agreement between the Democrats and President Trump is reached over building a border wall on the USA's border with Mexico, shutting down the government could leave the USA somewhat unprepared and open to an unexpected attack from outside. And now that both the USA and Russia have withdrawn from the INF Treaty, a scenario in which the USA could be attacked by Russia or even China, or maybe even North Korea, could certainly fall within the realm of possibility. 
So I believe it is important to keep an eye on this as well as the role that China will play in the weeks ahead, given that Russia and China have begun to switch from the dollar to trading in their own currencies. The approval of a law in seven US states now to allow abortions up to birth in a country where close to 60 million babies have now been murdered would also seem to be part of a plan to invoke God's judgment over this nation. This law would also seem to be fulfilling Revelation 12 on a deeper and new level. And given what is now legal to do in these seven states, we did not see this connection to Revelation 12 before. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. If God judged Israel for offering up their children to Molech, then there is also judgment in store for the USA for not repenting from the sin in which the lives of innocent people who could have played a role in God's plan for the world are ended by their parents simply because of the inconvenience they are perceived to be. In another development, Pope Francis visited the UAE and has signed a peace agreement with the Muslim nations where we can also see concerted effort to establish a one world religion that will soon have the Antichrist at the center of its worship. This unification of religions, however, is preparing the world for the arrival of the Antichrist, who will be the recipient of worship from all religions once he is revealed. Next, I would like to look at the current situation in the Middle East, and also the focus of today's analysis. My goal in sharing this with you is to point out correlations between what I see happening in the world and what is prophesied in the Word of God. And even if my interpretation is incorrect, I believe that there are strong correlations between the information I will discuss today and what we read in the Word of God regarding the end times. I do this simply to encourage those who are watching for our Lord's return and to point out passages in the Word of God that are lining up with what we see happening before us. Israel is currently preparing for general elections on April 9th and considering the timing of Brexit on March 29th, we see that these two milestones are less than two weeks apart. Now in addition to this, the Trump administration has indicated that it will wait until after Israel's elections to release the details of Trump's deal of the century, in order to respect Netanyahu's request to only reveal the plan after the elections. However, we also have to ask why this peace plan's contents have been kept secret and why the timing of its release is said to determine the plan's success, when the Palestinians who form an integral part of the process have indicated that they will not negotiate and that Trump's plan is a non-starter in their eyes. Now consider this question. How would delaying the release of information improve the success of the plan in this situation. It simply does not make logical sense. Would it not be more logical for the US to reveal the contents of the plan and then to see if the Palestinians would be willing to change their minds regarding negotiations in light of the new information presented and showing them how they would benefit? There is no reason to believe that the timing at which Trump's plan is revealed would improve the chances of its adoption, where no information is provided up front. There have been many reports on what some of the contents of this plan entails, but those who are part of Trump's peace team have denied all of these reports. This leads me to believe that the timing at which Trump's deal of the century is released has more to do with the impact and repercussions it will have on the world when God's land and Jerusalem is divided up than to get Israel and the Palestinians to agree to live in peace together. There are four news articles that were recently published that I would like to discuss today in connection with the information discussed so far and how these could all be tied together on more than one level to what we read in the Word of God. In the first article we see that one of the prominent rabbis in Israel Shaim Kanievsky 
was reported to claim that Israel's Messiah will appear on Purim this year and will finish with Israel's elections. Now we know that the Word of God tells us that Israel will accept a person that will come in his own name as their Messiah and will not be allowed to know who their true Messiah is until their blindness is removed once the fullness of the Gentiles had come in. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. The timing that this rabbi mentions in his statement is also very important to note, especially when the Word of God provides us with information pointing to the same timing and the possibility of the man of sin being revealed to Israel and being accepted by Israel as their Messiah. The fact that this rabbi stated that Israel's Messiah would be revealed on Purim this year is very important to keep in mind and Israel will celebrate Purim this year on March 21st. On January 21st, Iran launched a medium-range surface-to-surface missile at the Golan Heights from Syria, after which Israel responded by attacking several Iranian installations in Syria. What is important to note is the date on which this took place, January 21st. On February 1st, a top general in Iran's Revolutionary Guard made a statement in which he claimed that Iran is able to destroy Israel within three days and can do so before the USA would be in a position to help Israel. In another article that was posted by Debka on January 31st, it was reported that a meeting was held in Beirut that involved Hezbollah's Hassan Nasrallah and Palestinian terrorist chiefs who have stated that they plan to disrupt Israel's election campaign by attacks that will mainly be coming from Gaza in the time leading up to the elections. This meeting apparently came about through a coordinated signal that was received from Tehran and Beirut which called the parties together for this planning session. The article continues to report that precision weaponry had now passed into the hands of the resistance in Lebanon and Gaza, and based on what Iran said a little earlier, these plans would seem to have Israel's annihilation as end goal. What I find very interesting in this article is the timing at which the planned attacks against Israel are set to peak, and the maximum intensity or impact is set to occur three weeks before polling day in Israel. Once again, ask yourself this question. Why does this peak have to be reached three weeks before the election and why not a week earlier or a week later? I will show you why this timing is so important. Just yesterday, on February the 6th, there were reports of unprovoked attacks from Gaza where rockets were fired into Israel, landing in an open field and causing no damage. But it would seem that the first stages of this plan is underway. I have provided links in the description below to all the articles that I will share with you today, if you would like to read them in more detail. The timing of these planned attacks against Israel just happens to line up with the week during which Israel will celebrate Purim, and the timing at which Rabbi Kanievsky is expecting Israel's Messiah to be revealed. We also have to take into account that the events playing out before us may be part of a sinister plan that was penned by Albert Pike in 1871, in which he described how three world wars will have to be carried out in order to bring the light of Lucifer into the world. The first two world wars followed his plan precisely, as it was instructed, and the third of these are planned to occur between the political Zionists and Islam. You are welcome to read about these plans for all three of these wars from a link that I have provided in the description below. I will just focus on an excerpt regarding the start of World War III, which is planned to start between the Muslim nations and the political Zionists. The Third World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agenda of the Illuminati, 
between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam and political Zionism mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual and economical exhaustion. Could it be that the timing of the planned attacks by the leaders of the Muslim nations in the time leading up to Israel's elections could be following the instructions of Pike's plan, especially given the timing that would seem to involve great destruction and Israel also expecting their Messiah during this time? While the word of God shows us that this will be the man of sin, or the light of Lucifer as referred to by Pike in his letter. So if this is the enemy's plan to bring about a situation through which the man of sin can be revealed to the world, what does the word of God have to say about this, and are there any connections between these events that are scheduled for mid-March, and what we read in God's word? When we read Zechariah 1, we realize that 70 years are considered to be part of a future milestone for Israel at the time that this was written, and that certain events linked to the book of Revelation and shown to be part of the apocalypse are also associated with Israel after 70 years are complete. Please consider what is written in Zechariah 1. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years? This question is asked when Israel would have reached a seventy-year milestone. In Zechariah 1 we see a horseman on a red horse being associated with Israel at the seventy-year mark, tying it to the second horseman described in Revelation 6. The context in which these words are spoken would also seem to be describing the situation and time just before the seals as described in Revelation are opened, given that this passage specifically mentions the earth being at peace. I saw by night, and behold a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him there were red horses, speckled and white. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still, and is at rest. There are a number of interesting aspects mentioned in this passage. This conversation clearly describes a moment in time where a calm before a storm exists, and this being associated with Israel reaching a 70-year milestone. I have always wondered how the passage in Psalms 90 is related to the generation mentioned in Matthew 24 that would see the fulfillment of prophecies associated with the second coming of Israel's Messiah and where the 70 or 80 years would be considered the length of such a generation. Please consider the following two verses. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. However, when we bring what is said in Zechariah into consideration as well, the age of this generation seems to be associated with 70 years for Israel, and also confirmed for us in a matching pattern that we find when we look back at Israel's time in Babylon. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 
70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. In Zechariah, the earth is described at rest with horsemen on the scene and at the ready, standing between myrtle trees, when Israel had reached the 70-year milestone. The red horse is prominent in this passage and is associated with peace being removed from the earth when we connect it to what we read in Revelation 6. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Something that I find very interesting is the fact that when we look at Israel's calendar, they are adding a thirteenth month to this year, which means that the first month of the next Hebrew year is pushed out to fall in April. When we look at TorahCalendar.com, this additional month is only added next year, which means that there will exist a discrepancy between the calendar that Israel is using and the calendar as determined by TorahCalendar.com. Now I am not saying that either is wrong or correct. I am simply looking at events that are scheduled on both and how these line up with what we see happening in the world and in the heavens on God's timepiece. If you have watched this channel and those of other watchmen, you will know that we have had a myriad of very unique blood moons and eclipses over the past number of years, and that they form part of a symmetrical pattern that was discovered by Paul Grevis. I have to apologize to both Paul and Dan Matson for my confusion on who the author of this was, as I stated that Dan was the author of this chart in a previous video. Apologies to both. The last of the series of blood moons occurred on January 21st when Iran fired a missile at the Golan Heights. You will also recall that there were a significant number of blood moons that occurred over the past few years, but after January 21st of 2019, the next blood moon will only occur again in 2021, more than two years removed from the one on January 21st. What is further interesting is that the blood moon of January 2019 is one in a series of three supermoons that will occur in succession, with the other two falling on February 19th and March 21st, which also marks the day following the spring equinox. The supermoon that occurs on February 19th is the largest of these three, being closest to the Earth of the three, and will be in conjunction with Regulus during this time. Now this is also quite interesting as when we look at the Hebrew calendar all three of the supermoons occur on dates during which Israel will be celebrating feasts. The first of these fell on Tuba Shavat or the New Year for Trees, the same day on which Iran fired a missile at the Golan Heights and on which the Superwolf blood moon occurred. The next one occurs on the eve of February 19th which is Purim Katan or Minor Purim which Israel keeps during leap years. The final supermoon occurs on March 21st, which on Israel's calendar is shown to be Purim, and this is where it gets really interesting. If we look at the same schedule but use TorahCalendar.com, we find that the supermoons once again fall on feast days, but in this case February 19th marks Purim and March 21st falls on the Feast of Passover. Considering this discrepancy, we have to consider how Israel goes about determining which years require a 13th month. And this practice originated during the Talmudic times and when Israel was exiled to Babylon. On a website where the origins of calculating the Metonic Hebrew calendar is explained, we read the following. A pregnant year, Shana me uberet, is the Hebrew term for a lunar leap year, and it has been in use at least since Talmudic times. The Hebrew verb la'aber means to impregnate, and ubar is a fetus, and it's easy to see why a year with an extra month is suggestive of a woman with child. The onset of a pregnant year, it is explained there, is decided upon in the previous year by the delegated rabbinic authorities on the basis of three indicators the arrival of spring and its vegetation, the ripening of summer fruit and the timing of the vernal and autumnal equinoxes. 
should the authorities decide to add a 13th month in the year to come. This is done by means of a second Adar, a clear borrowing from the Babylonian second Adaru. This practice that originated during Israel's exile in Babylon would seem to point to traditions of men being incorporated in determining the years that should receive extra months rather than keeping to the word of God when it comes to determining the months of a year. Also notice how a year having 13 months is associated with a woman with child, linking it once again to Revelation 12 and some other passages in which Israel's travail is described, which I will get to in a moment. I believe it is very important to consider the impact that this difference between the two calendars could have and to consider the possibility that Israel could be keeping the Feast of Purim that is marked by a supermoon when they may, in fact, be required to keep Passover, which will also be marked by the same supermoon, if no extra month was added to this Hebrew year. If you have watched some of my earlier videos, you will know that Jesus' crucifixion also fell on a Passover that occurred at the spring equinox and that it too was marked by two celestial markers that occurred within 18 hours from each other. So it would not be inconceivable to consider the possibility that Israel's determination of their leap years may be incorrect, and that this may even form part of the prophecies that we see in the Word of God relating to the time during which Jacob's trouble or the tribulation will start. So with Israel intending to celebrate Purim on March 21st, what do we know about Purim? Purim is, of course, the celebration of the Jews' victory over the evil Haman, who was planning to kill all the Jews and Esther, who then became the Queen of Persia in the process. Now coming back to what we read in Zechariah 1, I have for almost two years wondered why myrtle trees are mentioned in this passage. And while I was writing the script, the Lord put Myrtle and Purim in my thoughts together. And this is what I discovered on a website when I was searching for this on Google, revealing something very important about Esther, whose Hebrew name is Hadassah. The name Hadassah is derived from the Hebrew word Hadas, a myrtle tree from the Myrtaseah family. It is clear then that the passage in Zechariah 1 is strongly associated with the time of Purim, given the connection to Esther's Hebrew name. Also note how the Lord answers the question that was asked in verse 12. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem, and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. So at this point the Lord gives the angel a tender response, and also instructs a cry to be made, or the final warning to be sent out into the world, which reminds me of what we read in Matthew 25. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Purim for Israel is the most joyous of all their feasts, and a feast during which they are encouraged to experience pleasure. This is what is said about Purim in an article on the times of Israel. At the heart of Purim is a sublime joy and happiness unlike anything that is experienced on the other Jewish holidays. First and foremost, it is undeniable that physical pleasure plays an important role in experiencing joy on Purim. Now given Iran's threats towards Israel and the fact that this confederacy between Iran, Lebanon and the Palestinians in Gaza plan to disrupt Israel's elections in the time leading up to April 9th, with precision missile attacks that are planned to peak in the week that Israel will be celebrating the Feast of Purim on their calendar, and that this will occur in a pregnant year or in a year that has 13 months. Consider what is written in this passage from Isaiah. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously and the spoiler spoileth. 
Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, all the signs thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain, pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it, I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted, fearfulness affrighted me, the night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. This passage from Isaiah has stood out for me for many years now, regarding the time at which Jacob's trouble will commence, but this year it seems to have a very profound application when we take all of this information into account. This passage would also suggest that Trump, who is known as a deal maker, and who authored The Art of the Deal, could go back on his promise to Netanyahu to keep the contents of the deal of the century hidden until after Israel's elections. The fact that we read about Israel's night of pleasure in this passage could very possibly point to the time during which they will be celebrating the Feast of Purim, which may be at play when these events will play out. As I mentioned earlier, the possibility that Israel's calendar may be incorrect and that they may have added an extra month to the wrong year could very well mean that they may be celebrating Purim during the time when the Lord expects them to keep the Feast of Passover. When we look at some of the parallels between Israel's escape from Egypt when they trusted in the blood of lambs and the escape that is promised to those who have placed their faith in the redemptive power of the blood of the Lamb of God, we can clearly see how the events that occurred on Passover for Israel could be repeated for the church. This is of course explained to us in Paul's mention of that escape in 1 Thessalonians 5. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. From what we read in Zechariah 1 and Isaiah 21, both passages would seem to be applying to the Feast of Purim, but there are also distinct differences between these two. In Zechariah, the association to Purim is through the myrtle trees that are connected to Esther, and the words recorded by Zechariah coming from the Lord. In Isaiah 21, the connection to Purim is made through the mention of Israel's night of pleasure, which would point to a joyous feast, which would be Purim. In this case, it is Israel talking and telling about the fear that came upon them during this time, which would occur in a year where they added an extra month to the year in the image of the woman with child that is also mentioned in this passage. This discrepancy between the two passages where the Lord speaks with comfortable words in Zechariah and Israel experiencing fear and birth pangs in Isaiah on what would seem to be the same feast day could be explained through the addition of an extra month at the wrong time and Israel subsequently keeping the feast of Purim at the time when they are supposed to have kept the Passover. The Word of God clearly shows us that there will be people who will not be caught unawares when our Savior returns, and when we put all of this information together, there would seem to be a spotlight shining on the time during which Israel will celebrate Purim this year. Now I'm not saying that this will definitely happen. I am simply looking at what is happening in the world and considering what the Word of God has to say through prophecies that match the events we see playing out before us. I could be completely wrong about this, but I find it very exciting to look at opportunities during which a convergence between prophecies in the Word of God and events that are occurring in the world could point to our escape from the sinful world and entering the joyful and glorious presence of our Heavenly Father and His Son. And there is certainly nothing I desire more than this. I am sharing this with you so that if these events continue to converge with the prophecies I have pointed out today, 
that you can be in a position to have oil in your lamps for light and that you are found ready to join the bridegroom in the marriage. I also plan to do a video in which I will look at some of the parallels between Passover and the believer's escape from destruction. But it would be too long to add to this video and I will share that with you, God willing, in the next video. So what can we expect to see happening in the world over the next few weeks? Once again, I am not a prophet and I am simply connecting events that I see occurring in the world with what is prophesied in the word of God and I could certainly be wrong about this. I also do not know if the connections to Purim as shown to you from the word of God applies to this year or some future year. But I think you will agree with me when I say that there are some very interesting connections between what is happening in the world and what the word is showing us. I believe we could see calm on the earth up to the 19th of February where Purim on God's calendar may fall and a midnight cry that could go out around this time that would let those who are watching for the Lord's return know that the time to prepare for the bridegroom's return is upon us. I am not sure in what form this cry would be made, but let's wait and see what happens. There may also be events happening outside of Israel that would further confirm that the red horse's rider is ready to begin his work in which peace will finally be removed from the earth once the restrainer is removed. Based on what we read in Isaiah 21, I believe there is a possibility for the Middle East peace plan to be announced before April 9th and for President Trump to go back on the assurance that he gave Benjamin Netanyahu that he would not release the plan until after Israel's elections. In my opinion, we will also see an escalation in war activities between Israel and its Muslim neighbors in the weeks leading up to the intended peak of these attacks that are planned for the time during which Israel will celebrate Purim. Some of these attacks may have already begun on February 6th, we are certainly living in times where many people who have been watching for the Lord's return over the past two millennia would have wished that they could be in the privileged position that we find ourselves in. If you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there is no better day than today to do so. While there is time to receive His grace, the Bible tells us the following That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If you have not done this yet, you can do this right now and become a child of God, who is born of God's Spirit. Jesus paid the price for your sins on the cross and cleansed you from all sins with His blood if you would put your faith in Him. He is giving you the opportunity to become a child of God as a free gift to you. All you have to do is to realize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Confess your sinfulness to the Lord and understand that only the blood of Jesus has the power to cleanse you completely of your sins and He has already done that for you. All that you have to do is to accept this wonderful gift through faith and to thank Him for His love towards you. There is nothing that you could add to this to earn any part of your salvation. It is all thanks to what Jesus did on the cross for you. If you accept this gift that He has provided for you through faith, then you can look forward with excitement to meeting our Redeemer in the air very soon. Please do so today if you have not done so before and receive everlasting life through Jesus that our Heavenly Father has promised to everyone that will believe. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you, and may he make his face shine upon you, and may he give you peace that transcends all understanding. 
Until next time, or until we meet our Savior and each other in the air. God bless.